and welcome to another episode of Earth 911 Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, and we're back with another fascinating interview. Uh, this time it's going to be with Amy Westervelt, who you might know from NPR, from The Guardian, The New York Times, and her own podcast, Drilled, which is a true crime style podcast about climate change. And if you're not listening today, you should be subscribing soon. Uh, Amy is also the creator of the Critical Frequency Podcast Network. It focuses on climate issues. Uh, and she was a winner in 2016 of the Edward R. Murrow Award for her exposés about the uh, hidden environmental and human costs of Tesla's Gigafactory in Nevada. Uh, that's particularly close to my heart. I learned to do radio in the same room that Ed Murrow did at WSU. So uh, mm -hmm. congratulations on that. Now, we're going to talk about plastic. That's the subject today. What's going on with plastic? It's the middle of Plastic Free July. And... At the same time, plastic seems to be enjoying a sustainability renaissance in the media, despite all the concern the public has about uh, plastic pollution. Now, we've covered several plastic recycling technologies recently, and we encourage people to use less plastic all the time. But we're also hoping that if you do buy, buy plastic, you recycle it. Amy's first drilled episode this, month, uh, this year is about plastic and the machinations of one media manipulator named Rick Berman who has launched the Save the Plastic Bag Coalition among many skeezy campaigns backed by the tobacco, plastic, and oil industries. So you can follow Amy's work at amywestervelt.com. Uh, that's Westervelt with a V, V-E-L-T. And the Drilled Podcast is at criticalfrequency.org slash drilled. Amy, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me. I'm good. How are you? Hanging oh, in there. It's a, <laughs> day in the Pacific Northwest, we haven't had record heat in a couple of weeks, but uh, we're expecting Man. that. Yeah, I actually live up up in the Sierra Nevada, um, and we have been having not quite Pacific Northwest level heat, but it's been it's just hasn't stopped since maybe like the third week of June. You kind of so get past the tipping. It's getting point. old. It's getting old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your new season of Drilled kicked off uh, last week, and can you tell us what you think the biggest issues facing your listeners as they wrestle with the implications of climate change are right now? What are you going to be covering this year? Well, this season in particular, I'm looking at the natural gas industry from kind of all sides. We've, um, you know, I, I started reporting this season maybe two years ago and wound up in this position that will be familiar to anyone who has like reported on this stuff where I had so many things and I um I was like you know I don't I don't really want to get rid of any of these angles so we're doing a three-part season in part because you know the fossil fuel industry is pushing as it has in the past the idea that natural gas is part of a green transition that it is part of a climate solution, all of those things, like all of these talking points that have really been debunked over the last decade are still being pushed today. And so I felt like it was it was a good time to really dig into uh, the many, many, both environmental and climate implications of natural gas. And the reason I wanted to start with this, um, this series on plastic is because I, I think that the industry has done a really masterful job of somehow getting people to forget that plastic is made from fossil fuels <laughs> and, and that, um, yes, it is like an immediate environmental scourge and it, it gets, you know, it doesn't break down and it gets into the stomachs of birds and fish and all of these things that, that, you know, we've been hearing about for a long time now, but it is also, uh, a major contributor to climate change. You know, the um, one of the the plants that we're looking at in this story is um, projected to be the number one contributor of CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions in the country when it's online and it makes plastic. Um, so anyway, I I feel like it's it's kind of um, just a good time to really like get settled in people's minds the idea that natural gas is not in fact a climate solution and that it is actually part of lots of more immediate environmental problems as well. 
you know, you start off the show talking about how 10 years ago, plastic seems, seemed to have really lost its luster, but it kept growing. Uh, we use mm-hmm. more of it than ever. And it's back with this new sustainability message. What's, what, what happened? Well, I think that what happened, I mean, what we've kind of found happened is that, well, two things. One, that the fracking boom really led to a plastics boom because fossil fuel companies realized that they could make plastic out of some of the byproducts of fracking, which is, you know, the the word for hydraulic fracturing. It's a way that people drill to get uh, both gas and oil. And um, that, that, that if they could use these kind of byproducts of, of fracking to make plastic, that that was a cheaper feedstock than petroleum, which is how plastic has usually been made. Um, and so there was this kind of drive to, to do that, to create all these what they call ethane cracker facilities, to take those um, elements from fracking and turn them into uh, plastic nurdles to make all kinds of, of plastic things. And at the same time, you know, there's been a, um, a downturn in use of fossil fuels for transportation and residential, even before the pandemic that was starting to happen. So, you know, fossil fuel companies are, are not run by idiots. (laughs) You know, they, they can read the tea leaves better than most. And they, for a long time have been, talking about how petrochemicals and especially plastic is essentially their escape hatch for when revenues drop off in these other sectors. Um, so as much as, you know, I think the fossil fuel industry is pretty good at trying to make it seem like all these problems are really just driven by consumer demand. In fact, you know, when as consumer demand falls in one area, they look for ways to um, gin it up elsewhere or to shift their supply chain in a way that they can continue to, you know, kind of produce and sell the same amount of stuff. So the, one of the, 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 the artistries that you're, you're describing is this misdirection that yes. petrochemical industries have, have mastered over the course of the past 50 years since they mm-hmm. first decided to suppress climate change information. Uh, you, you, you profile Rick Berman in the first show, and he's the spinster beside, behind the Save the Plastic Bag Coalition. He, you know, strikes me as the Frank Lutz of the 20s, <laughs> hopefully not the 20s. Yeah. But how dangerous is this guy to the public discourse about plastic? I think extremely dangerous. You know, I mean, he really, um, he was kind of, he, I feel like Rick Berman sort of picked up where, you know, the infamous crying Indian ad left off, right? This is an ad from the 1970s that was created by the packaging industry um, to through, through Keep create, America Beautiful. Yes, through Keep America Beautiful, which sounded like, you know, just a conservation org, right? <laughs> um, to convince people that all this pollution that they were seeing was their problem and that, you know, it was all people being litter bugs and all these kinds of things and not, you know, the companies that were uh, profiting from packaging. And, you know, then, yeah, fast forward a few decades and you have Rick Berman, who is um, coming up with all kinds of front groups for the, the plastic companies and, um, yeah, my favorite is the, the Save the Plastic <laughs> Coalition, which which actually, you know, like filed lawsuits to try to stop um, bag bans. They also, um, you know, Berman and, and, um, and the Save the Plastic Bag Coalition tried to even pass preemptive laws in some states to right. say that they couldn't pass bag bans and things like that. So um, I think that... In general, I mean, I don't know. I, I um, spend a lot of time researching disinformation across multiple industries, and I think that it is a really big problem. And it, um, I think there's a, a little bit of a, a sense that it's a you know kind of a recent thing that's come about, you know, um, and that oh, it's social media, it's this, it's that. But I, I, these kind of these tactics have been used by 
um, industries that have some, you know, need to get around regulation for a really long time. And so they are now very sophisticated and they know exactly what works. And, you know, Berman is like very um, good at his job. <laughs> you know? He's good at being he's, evil in a way. Uh, is, yes. Uh, I mean, his, yeah, his nickname is Dr. Evil. I don't know who christened him that, but it's stuck. So yeah. Yeah. Well, so what should we, what tales, what spin should we, we be watching out for uh, from, from the Rick Berman sector of, of this discussion? Yeah, I think um, number one is that there is, there continues to be um, this very effective strategy to divorce plastic from fossil fuels. So, um, you know, just, I think we cannot remind people enough that those two things are inextricably linked and um, that not only does it take fossil fuels to make plastic, but also, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it like the, the the factories making this stuff also emit CO two and other greenhouse gases. So um, it's very very closely tied to climate change. And I mean that's something that I think I don't I saw even in the climate movement for a long time that people almost kind of poo pooed plastic as like oh it's like a consumer issue or it's like a short term environmental issue or like it's a mom issue. That was a thing I saw too. And, and like, um, you know, we can't, we can't think about these things as separate issues. Um, that's, so that's a big one. And then I think, you know, as a result of the pandemic, the, um, petrochemical lobby pushed really hard to try to get a lot of, um, people thinking that, you know, everything had to be wrapped in, plastic and they managed to you know really increase usage uh pretty significantly but we're seeing already that that is not looking like it's going to hold so that's good um but yeah just kind of i would say if if you hear something like oh it's unsafe to bring your your bags to the grocery store (laughs) like figuring out where that came from is uh is a good idea yeah, it's been good to see my reusable bags being acceptable again. But um, yes. that's so bizarre that reusable bags wouldn't be acceptable. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, in the early days of COVID, I think it was just there were so many unknowns and no one really knew how it would spread. So, so yeah. But, you know, the plastic bag lobby was behind that, too. The, um, AFPM, the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers, uh, really pushed for um, this this. They, I mean, they put out kind of a, um, I, I can't say fake exactly because they're quite, you know, careful about not directly lying, but a very misleading study about um, the dangers of people's reusable bags. And it worked for a while. Um, you know? So, yeah. I, I, I'm, su- I'm surprised I've survived using my reusable bags based on what they told me. Now, let me ask a question. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the petrochemical industry could ever get circularity and actually practice it? Because, you know, one of the pr- problems is the extraction of more oil or gas in order to produce plastic. But then we've also been talking with molecular recycling technology makers recently, and they claim that they can break plastic all the way back down to the individual molecules that you could then use to make more plastic, which, of course, eliminates the need for more drilling. Is mm. Is that viable based on what you have learned about the plastic industry? Even if we did master that level of of recycling, is oil ever going to give up on oil? Yeah, this is where the fact that so many of the, you know, plastics companies are actually oil companies really becomes a problem, you know, uh, because if... If it was a packaging manufacturer that had no ties at all to the fossil fuel industry, then yeah, maybe. But I don't know that there are any companies that fit that description, you know? So unfortunately, they are currently tied to uh, another industry that has a very large interest in um, in keeping fossil fuels in in the mix with plastic so i think there's no there's no way really to get that work 
to get that to work if you um if you can't kind of get the fossil fuel guys out of the way and and like i said i mean they really like if you look at their annual reports for the last five or six years they're really banking on plastic as a as you know kind of this silver bullet save for um for their revenue as people transition away from fossil fuels so uh, yeah i don't know i mean i i hate to be this like you know negative nancy that's like you know they're never going to do it but I, i think that that really if we want the fossil fuel companies to behave differently they have to be required to behave differently they're not people as much as they have worked really hard to convince everyone that they are their companies and they are going to do whatever they can legally do to maximize shareholder profits that's why that's their entire reason for existence and um and that's fine like i don't i don't you know they're doing what they've been legally set up to do right so um if we want them to do something different then we have to change the structure in which they're operating so that's that's an interesting question. What's the first step to making that change? And, and we had Sarah Dearman from the Recycling Partnership on our show a, a couple of weeks ago, and she mm-hmm. pointed out something really important, which is that we really need to just simplify the plastic we use. The, yes. The plastic number seven is just everything invented since the numbers were introduced, basically. <laughs> right. So is all unrecyclable. Right. And Sarah's point was, you know, if we forced the industry to make recyclable plastics and put the recycling in place, that would be yeah. a, a good step. Is do you think that's that's true? Absolutely. Yeah. I think I think definitely. I mean, for I just think that for far too long the government has kind of gone along with the industry's strategy, which is to make this a consumer problem. And it's not. I mean, yes, consumers have a responsibility. And, you know, there are things that we can buy less of or buy differently and and so forth. But if there, if in a case like this, where it's like, we have no control over what type of plastic, you know, is used by these companies, then it it has to be regulated. So let's talk about Plastic Free July. Uh, You've you've explained that you have complicated feelings about it. just yeah. to focus on ocean plastics, which is well founded, distract mm-hmm. us from this, you know, still rising tide of plastic that's that's washing through our lives. I think so. I think I think it's a both and. Um, mm-hmm. I think that we absolutely need to um, get on top of the ocean plastics problem, and part of how we do that is by stemming the amount of plastic that's being made. Period. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I would say too, just, just, um, kind of following on from the last point too, about, about consumer action. I don't at all, I would never, ever suggest that someone reducing the amount of plastic that they use in their own life is, um, not a valuable endeavor. It 100% is, um, not just because, you know, people should live their values and that's like a good thing to do in general but also because you know it models that behavior for other people if like you know like with plastic free july part of the point right is to get so many people doing it at once that it really does actually like show up on on the balance sheets of these companies and things like that and i think that that is a super worthy endeavor um and i think that you know really kind of the the way that that kind of action um, delivers real results is by connecting with, you know, other people who are doing the same things and then connecting that action to larger policy pushes. Well, and, and the, the challenge for me with Plastic Free July is that it tends to focus on, on certain artifacts, plastic artifacts like the straw. Right. Um, it, you know, because there's there's the walrus with the straw that smells. Everybody knows that image. Uh, yeah. You know the image of the plastic in the stomachs of animals. Uh, but, right. But what I feel like happens during when people focus on ocean plastic is they kind of ignore all the other plastic that's in their life. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's thinking critically about your choices, which I don't think we're armed to do with information these days. How mm-hmm. do you... How do you suggest people communicate to brands that they 
do business with that they want less plastic? What do you think works? That's a good question because I do think that when there's a critical mass of consumers all saying, you know, we want you to do X, Y, Z, companies do start to listen to that. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I, I, I kind of think like less packaging across the board is a good, a good kind of message to be giving to, to companies. And I think, um, you know, using recyclable plastic, if they're going to use plastic, ideally moving away from plastic packaging altogether. And I mean, I think, I feel like, like there's a good example of this in the Brita filter, um, case study have you have you looked at this yeah like where you know it's like one thing that like people were just like why can't we why can't this happen you know and they have they have actually like taken steps to um to improve that whole um product line and, and supply chain process which is great uh but i think that that um I don't know. I, th- I feel like that's kind of, that's kind of the key is like focusing on one thing, getting lots of people involved, getting lots of attention on it and having a really specific ask for companies tends to be the thing that works. Would you, um, would and there again, letter? would you write a letter saying, Hey, I love your products, but I just am not going to buy them anymore unless I, you get rid of the plastic. I think you could write a letter. It's probably more effective if you write a letter that represents like, you know, 5,000 people, people. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or 10,000 people. Yeah. Like, I think it's, it's sort of like, if you can coordinate your letter with lots and lots of other people and like maybe get some press on it too, that tends to, um, to have some impact. But well, there again, it's like, it's kind of, you know, the thing that works is being really specific and focusing on one thing. Right. But then you end up with this problem of companies kind of doing one thing at a time instead of addressing the problem writ large, which I know some companies are starting to do too. Like I know, you know, Unilever has had this program for a long time where they're trying to reduce the amount of plastic in, um, in their packaging. A lot of the beauty companies are looking at it too. Um, and I, and I think that, that a lot, I would say probably all of that has been driven by, consumer demand and um organizing like you know people who who are able to sort of organize all those consumer voices into um into a campaign well i'll tell you it's great to have someone like you out there doing the reporting you're doing to help us catalyze that movement because it is effective you know we we see it at earth 911 that people make a difference in how companies serve them but Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for taking your time. Can you tell us, you know, how to keep up on Drilled and find yeah. other critical frequency podcasts? Yes. Yeah. So all things Drilled um, are living at drillednews.com. We have uh, both all of the, we've done five seasons to date. This is our sixth season and all of those are cataloged on the podcast page, but then we also have quite a bit of um supplementary reporting around all of those seasons yeah, you and can, then you can have a good time reading about it it's, yeah there's, it's a, there's a lot there i know i need to i was just looking at it today that i need to maybe um go in and, and organize it more because there's so much now um and then we also have um a newsletter called hot take that comes out every sunday um and you can find out more about that at hot take pod.com and that also has a podcast attached to it and then critical frequency um, is criticalfrequency.org and we have several podcasts many of which are environment or climate Mm -hmm. themed so yeah great well amy i want to thank you for your time and uh thank you so much yeah thank you so much you too We've been talking with Amy Westervelt. Uh, she is uh, uh, the host of the Drilled Podcast and, of course, uh, co founder of the Critical Frequency Podcast Network. So check her out at Amy Westervelt. That's Westervelt with a B dot com. Uh, and uh, she's uh, at uh, criticalfrequency.org slash drilled uh, is where you can find uh, the Drilled Podcast and learn more about the show and all the background information there because it really is. There's a lot there to dig into if you find the the topic interesting. 
This is Earth 911 Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, and we're going to be back with another interview soon. In the meantime, I hope you'll share this podcast with your friends. We've got to get these ideas out there, folks, so that everybody starts thinking about when and how to use plastic responsibly, amongst so many other things. Take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet. We'll be back soon. Have a great day. Thank you.